annual Black History program. Our theme this year is remembering our past and honoring our present. It goes without saying, we wish times were different and that we could gather in person. However, we've had to be nimble and embrace technology and um, come together virtually. As we begin this year's program, I wanna take a few moments to thank our committee. Our members were Ms. Diane Griffin, Natasha Adams, Kim Green, Council Member Rout, and Council Member Mendoza. I also wanna give a huge shout out to Diamond McDowell, our marketing superstar who helped with our messaging and promotional materials. As we begin, we would like to open the program with a word of prayer, so please bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we come together for this celebration of Black history, recognizing that our history is America's history. As we gather to reflect, learn, and honor our rich heritage, as well as celebrate the contributions of African Americans, please be with us and allow a spirit of unity, love, and respect to rule, reign, and abide in our hearts. To you we offer our prayers, our praise, and supplications. Amen. I also want to note we live in a diverse community, and I want to show respect to those who may not have a particular faith. And so with them in mind, I ask that we pause for a moment of silence. Amen, thank you. And now please sit back and get ready for a phenomenal program. Council member Jocelyn Rout will serve as our MC. And so without further ado, I'll now turn the program over to council member Rout. Thank you, Mayor James for welcoming our esteemed guests. The next voice you will hear will be Town of Bladensburg Ward 2 Councilwoman Carletta Lundy, who will be singing the Black National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing. Thank you, Councilmember Rout. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Remembering Our Past and Celebrating Black History, Honoring Our Past. Before I sing Lift Every Voice and Sing, I want to give you some history. Lift Every Voice and Sing, often called the Black National Anthem, was written as a poem by NAACP leader James Weldon Johnson, and then set to music by his brother John Rosamond Johnson in 1899. It was first performed in public in the Johnson's hometown of Jacksonville, Florida, as a part of a celebration of Lincoln's birthday on February the 12th, 1900, by a choir of 500 school children at the segregated Stanton School where James Weldon Johnson was the principal. Lift every voice and sing to let the heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the darkness has torn us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun, of our new day begun. Let us march on till victory is won. Woman Lundy for blessing us with that wonderful musical selection.
I have to share a fun fact about the Black History National Anthem to bring us to the president. Did you know that U.S. Representative James Clay Clyburn is the highest ranking African American in Congress? And he's a Democrat of South Carolina. In January, he introduced a measure that would make lift every voice and sing the national hymn and give it a special place alongside our country's national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner. In quote, to make it a national hymn, I think it would be an act of bringing the country together. The gesture itself would be an act of healing. Everyone can identify with that song. Yes, indeed, I truly agree with him. Next, we will have a presentation from Ms. Gwendolyn Briley Strand, who holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from Fordham University in New York City. She has performed as a professional actress on stage and on television and in film for over 30 years. She's a member of SAG-AFTRA, which stands for the Screen Actors Guild, American Federation of Television and Radio Artists, and Actors' Equity Association. She's also a proud member of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated. She's my soror. Her television credits include the Nash, include national commercials, HBO productions, MGM Pictures, NBC Television, Netflix production, House of Cards, and PBS TV. Her video, Harriet Tubman, The Chosen One, won the ITVA DC 2003 Peer Award at the National Press Radio Club in Washington, DC for independent feature. She also won the Peer Gold Award in 2011 for the narration of Mary Anderson, A Song of Dignity and Grace. Her one woman show, Harriet Tubman, The Chosen One, and Rosa Parks, Such a Time, have been performed for hundreds of schools and organizations throughout the United States and Canada. Harriet Tubman, The Chosen One, has also been presented at the J.F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts and the Smithsonian National Museum of American History in Washington, D.C. On September 24th, 2016, Ms. Briley Strand was given the honor of introducing the President of the United States, Barack Obama, and First Lady Michelle Obama, President George Bush, former First Lady Laura Bush, and dignitaries and celebrities at the grand opening of the African American Museum of History and Culture in Washington, D.C. Gwendolyn Briley Strand will be in full costume and her phenomenal acting skills will bring to you the courageous story of African American Harriet Tubman and multiple other characters to life. This inspiring and dynamic one woman show celebrates the life of that great African American woman, Harriet Tubman, my shero. Following the performance, we'll have a special Q&A segment. So make sure you write down your questions and put them in the chat in Zoom. Without further ado, I present to you, Harriet Tubman, The Chosen One. Hello, I'm Gwendolyn Briley Strand, and I welcome you to this performance of Harriet Tubman, The Chosen One. Now, Harriet Tubman was an extraordinary woman who lived from the 1820s to 1913. She was born and raised as a slave in Dorchester County, Maryland, and as an adult, she led many enslaved to freedom through the Underground Railroad. Now, because she led so many slaves to freedom, they nicknamed her Moses. But when the slaves were singing in the fields, that old spiritual go down Moses, everyone knew they were singing about a different Moses, their leader, Harriet Tubman. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that old spiritual, so I'll teach it to you. That way you can join me during the performance. It goes like this. When Israel was in Egypt's land, 
and let my people go. Oppressed so hard they could not stand. Let my people go. Go down, Moses, way down to Egypt's land. Tell old Pharaoh to let my people go. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. Y'all made it. <laughs> well, we got a couple of more hours before we start our journey. So go ahead, sit down on a tree stump or rock, rest a spell. We'll leave around midnight. Sky's nice and hazy. Moon's not too bright. Always bright enough to see the North Star. But it's not so bright we'll be seeing. Let's see, this is Saturday, and your master won't even realize that you're gone until Sunday. And there ain't nothing he can do about it till Monday morning. So that leaves us, what, oh, about, about a day and a half worth of road between us and them paddle rollers. And them paddle rollers hunting us down ain't the only thing y'all got to worry about. So everybody, pay attention and listen up. Now, this is going to be a hard trip that we're going on. You're going to be tired and hungry, cold and scared, but we're going to keep on moving. Because if you stop, you die. You see, my job is to get my people to the promised land of freedom, and I intend to do just that. So if you can't follow my orders, you want to turn backward, you best do it now. Because once we get started, there'll be no turning back. You got to move or die, even if I got to shoot you myself. See, I, I can't have nobody going back, and their master beating them so bad that they ends up giving up the secrets of the Underground Railroad. That would hurt all of our brothers and sisters that are trying to get to freedom. You see, freedom is a... It's a hard bought thing. <laughs> it demands a high price. It's not bought with dust or words, empty promises. It's bought with oneself, the bones, the flesh, the spirit. And once you've got it, cherish it. Now we got to go free, or we'll die trying. <laughs> Shh. Y'all hear that? that? That was our signal. Ooh, oh, Ooh, oh, oh. <laughs> Seems like we, we got a couple of more passengers be joining us. That signal sounded a bit far off. I, well, I guess it'd be a while before they catch up. <laughs> So some of y'all didn't hear that, did you? Well, you see, I pays attention to what others might ignore. When I was a youngin', my daddy Ben, he, he took me into the woods and swamp, and he taught me how to walk quiet. Hat, Hat, come here. Come here, child. Now, daughter, any old body can go through the woods crashing and mashing things down like a cow. That's easy. But you, girl, I want you to practice doing it the hard way. You be so quiet that, see, not even a bird on a nest to hear you and fly up. <laughs> Took me some time, but I learned. I remember one time I snuck up on Daddy, nearly scared him out his britches. <laughs> Girl, you move just like an engine. Not a twig crack or a leaf rustle when you come through here. You learn good girl. You know, we never did talk about why it was so important to be quiet. But deep down inside, I knew. See, for a runaway, the, the difference between life and death 
could be in the quiet. But even with all its dangers, Lord knows I'd rather be outside in the God sky than cooped up inside. But my first job was inside, working for Mrs. James Cook, dusting and cleaning and picking up her yarn. I was five years old when Master Brodus rented me out to her. Can you imagine that? Five years old. Now, Mrs. Cook, she was a weaver. She spent hours and hours cooped up in this, this tiny little room, bent over a loom, arms moving back. Fours, back, and forth. Oh, I, I hated being cooped up in there with no air to breathe, always picking up her yarn and, and winding it and winding it. Pick it up, girl. Pick it up, I said. You were so stupid and lazy. You're not even worth having around. Get out of my house. I know. You go help Master Cook, said his muskrat traps. Maybe being in that cold ice of water will make you think twice about being so lazy. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I'll go. I said I'll go. No, don't hit me. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what is cold? Well, I'm not going in that water. All right, all right, I'm going, I'm going. Ooh. Ooh. I wonder if muskrats bite. My father, how long, my father, how long, my father, how long, poor children suffer here, <laughs> Lord. Now you know it isn't right for them to treat me like this. I'm doing the best I can. It, it just never seems to be good enough. Oh God, I want to go home. Please, please make them, make them send me home. I went, and Lord, while you're at it, could you convert Master Brodus? Oh God, change that man's heart and make him a Christian, Lord. Convert Master. I got real sick with a fever from being in that cold water, and they sent me home. Mama took real good care. And they got me well again, but as soon as she did, Master Brodus rented me out again. This time to another white woman. I was to watch her baby. Oh, look at Mama's boy. Oh, look at you. Oh, you just, you just as precious. Yes. Oh, you just as precious. Mama loves you. Yeah. And you're going to. Grow up and be a fine, powerful man. Yes. <laughs> yes. 
Girl, get on over here and stop being such a scaredy cat. Get over here. Oh, Mama didn't mean to scare you. No. <laughs> Now, girl, you see my baby? Now, your job is to make sure my baby never cries. Do you understand me, girl? <laughs> never cries. Now, those of y'all with youngins know that ain't no easy job. Oh, I was forever rocking that baby. Either in my arms or in the cradle, and I wasn't but a little bit of thing myself. I rocked that baby day and night, night and day. But every night, the same thing would happen. Please, please don't cry, please. woman beat me and beat me so bad all the time that finally I just ran away. <laughs> but I only stayed away five days because I got so cold and scared. I, I had to go back and she gave me a really good whip in that time sent me back to Master Brodus. So there I was, five years old, on my way back home, sick, scared, tired, and in pain. I prayed, Lord, please don't let Master send me back there. Now, now you convert Master. And you convert him now. <laughs> Ooh. Forgive me, Lord. I didn't mean to tell you how to do your job. Lord, make me more patient. Lord, make me more patient. Lord, make me more patient until we meet again. Patient, patient, patient until we meet again. Well, I wondered just like all of y'all have, I'm sure. If this was all life was meant to be, I needed some hope. And then one day, I heard a story about a slave named Tice Davis. Now this story was told and retold in the slave quarters, in the fields, <laughs> even up at the big house. Children, <laughs> come gather round. <laughs> I just heard a story about a slave named Tyus David who ran away from his master 
in Kentucky. Oh, but this master, he got wind of it, and I ran right after Ties. Oh, always keeping him within his sight. So Ties, he had to jump into the water and swim the river. Oh, but his master, his master, he, he hunted him down in a boat, and he seed him. He seed him, reached the shore, no more than a whisper between them. And then, all of a sudden, Tash just disappeared. <laughs> like sweet cake in front of starving children. <laughs> now his master, oh, he was puzzled, greatly confused, more than he cared to admit. He said that Tash <laughs> must have gone on an underground railroad. <laughs> well, when I first heard that story, I was puzzled. Was there really a road that ran under the ground? Was that how Tice escaped his master? And if Tice could find this railroad, why couldn't other people find it too? Why, the free Negroes, the Quakers, the Methodists, the German farmers that helped runaway slaves in Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, they started using words suited to the railroad. They started calling themselves conductors and station masters and brakemen and their houses and barns and haystacks with all those secret passengers were known as stations and depots. And the runaways were called passengers, parcels, boxes, and bales of black wool. You know, when I was a little girl, I believed that there really was a steam train that went through a deep underground tunnel between the south and the north. And when a slave boy it in the south, oh, they'd be free <laughs> when they come up out the ground, snorting and puffing and leaving a trail of cinders behind. <laughs> if you get there before I do, coming for to carry me home. Tell all my friends I'm coming to, coming for to carry me home. Sing with me. Swing low, sweet chariot. Coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot. Coming for to carry me home. Home. Oh, freedom! I thought about it all the time. And then one day, I got to meet my own version of Tice. Oh, I must have been about, about 14, 15 years old when I saw a man, a, a slave, trying to run away like Tice. And the overseer, he saw him too, and he followed him. And so did I. Wait in the water. Wait in the water, brother. Wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. Oh, Lord, wait in the water oh no wait in the water brother wait in the water god's gonna trouble the water the overseer he he caught up with him down the road a piece at the crossroad store and he raised his whip and he yelled hold it boy girl you grab a hold of that boy so I can tie him to that tree. <laughs> and I can whip him good. But I couldn't. I just stood there, frozen between the overseer and the slave. And it gave the slave just enough time to run away. That overseer, he was so mad. He picked up a two pound lead weight off the counter and he threw it out to run away. But it missed. <laughs> oh, God. And it hit me instead. It tore my forehead wide open. I still bear the scar. I suffer from some 
some real bad headaches. And it's times when I fall into a deep sleep as I can't wake up. I never know when these spells are coming on me. My folks were real scared that because of my affliction, Master would sell me away. He tried real hard, too. He brought white people to our cabin all times of the, the day and night. And, and, they, and they'd, they'd look at me and they'd poke at me. <laughs> all right. All right, Edward. <laughs> Show me this girl. <laughs> Oh, Edward. Well, she's awfully skinny. <sighs> hmm. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. Forehead. She looks half dead. I can't buy this child, Edward. You should be the one to pay me to take her off your hands. Well, I prayed real hard after that. I laid in my bed and I prayed, Lord, please convert, Master. It's soft in that man's heart. But Lord, if you ain't never gonna change him, kill him. Take him out of the way so he won't do no more mischief. It wasn't too many months after that that Master Brodus passed away. <laughs> and it won't be long. <laughs> no, it won't be long. No, it won't be long. For poor children to suffer here. Now, Master Brodus' heir was too young to take on the workings of the plantation. So they hired on a temporary master named Doc Thompson. Doc Thompson hired me out to a builder named Master Stewart. At first, well, Master Stewart, he, he put me inside doing housework. But after a couple of months, I went to him and I pleaded, excuse me, excuse me, sir. So I, I was wondering if, well, if it'd be all right if, if I worked outside in the fields and the woods, with the menfolk. I, I don't feel work before, sir. Well, I was taught to use a broad axe by my papa. I can load wood on wagons. I can split rails. You see, sir, I, I, I know more about, about mules and plows than, than I ever knew about the insides of a house. Hmm. I don't know about that, Harriet. But you know, I would be getting a bargain if and you could do a man's work. <laughs> See, you being a female and all, well, you didn't cost as much. All right. We'll give it a try. Well, I worked from sun up to sundown. in the rain and in the snow uh, in the heat uh, and in the cold uh, my body grew strong and my muscles hardened I could do the jobs that tax the strength of grown men one day I was working in feel by the road when 
when a white woman in a wagon rode by. She stopped and she watched me for a few moments. Excuse me, excuse me. What's your name? Harriet. Harriet, how did you come by that, that deep scar on your forehead? That's a shame. Harriet. Now, if you ever need any help, you just let me know. I live, I live right down the road, a couple of miles in Bucktown. As soon as you get into town, it's a, it's a big white house with green shutters. You can't miss it. Now, outside the house, by the road, there's a lamp. If the lamp is lit, then it's, it's safe for you to come and knock by the door. But if the lamp is dark, you wait in the woods. You wait until the lamp is lit. Now, you remember that, Harriet. When the time comes, giddy up. Well, soon after that, times got harder and harder. Doc Thompson started selling slaves so he could pay his bills. Two of my sisters got sold down south on a chain gang. And y'all know what a horrible thing that is. It's, it's when they chain the slaves at the end. And sometimes at the neck, and they have to walk for miles and miles, chained like that. See, that's when I knew it was time for me to run away. You see, I reasoned it out in my mind that I had the right to one or two things, liberty or death. If I could not have one, I would have the other. For no man should take me alive. I should fight for my liberty as long as my strength lasted. When it's time for me to go, well then the Lord, he'd let him take me. Soon I will be done with the troubles of the world. Troubles of the world. The troubles of the world. Soon I will be done with the troubles of the world. Gone home to live with God. No more weeping and a wailing. No more weeping and a wailing. No more weeping and a wailing. I'm going to live with God. I persuaded two of my brothers to come with me, but they were useless, frightened. No good in the brush. Harriet? Harriet? Where did she go? I can't see nothing out here. Y'all get over here for you get lost. Get over here. Harriet? 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 scared us to death. Why we can't see in the dark. We got no cat eyes like yours. We uh we uh we gonna go back. We gonna go home. We can't do this. I knew the next time I'd leave alone. Well, two days later Word got back to me that Doc Thompson had sold me and my brothers to a Georgian trader, and we were to go south on a chain gang. Well, that was it. That night, when the quarter was asleep and the fires died down, I, I, I got me some ash cake and, and, and a goodly piece of salt herring, and I tied it. <laughs> in an old bandana. 
and I run dim woods to Bucktown. And I, I came to that, that woman's house. You, you, you know, the one that, that stopped and talked with me. <laughs> and the lamp was lit. <laughs> but I, I circled. Oh, oh, it was, it was quiet. A sound, a dog barking, nothing. So I, I knocked at the door. It's Harriet from Doc Thompson's place. She wasn't even surprised to see me. She just opened up the door and she... And she, she took me in my first night of freedom. <laughs> no more mistress call for me. No more, no more. No more mistress call for me, many thousand go. No more auction block for me, no more, thank you, Lord. No more, no more auction block for me, many thousand go. The next morning, she wrote down a name on a slip of paper. That was the next place it was safe for me to go. And it took me to a big house with a tall white gate. And the people that, that met me, they, they opened the door and they said, that's when I realized that the Underground Railroad wasn't no real railroad train. It was a lot of good, good people between the North and the South that didn't just talk about the hell slaves lived in, but they jumped into the fire and they pulled them out. <laughs> you go meet some of them fine folks on our journey together. Oh, my Lord, he calls me, he calls me by the thunder. The trumpet sounds within my soul. I ain't got long to stay here. Steal away, steal away, steal away to Jesus. Steal away, steal away home. I ain't got long to stay here. I remember the first time I stepped on the dirt of the free state of Pennsylvania. <laughs> I looked down at myself to see if I was the same person now that I was free. Oh, the trees and the fields had the look of gold. <laughs> I was just like heaven. <laughs> But, well, then came the bitter drop in my cup of joy. See, I was alone. There was no one to welcome me into the land of freedom. I, I was a stranger in a strange land. My home was back there in the quarter with the old folks, my brothers and sisters. My whole family was still in slavery. That's when I realized in order for me to be truly happy, I'd have to have my family with me. So I decided then I'd have to go back to Dorchester County. Who better than me, right? I'd done it before. The Lord would let me do it again. I worked real hard for about a year in a hotel in Philadelphia, cooking and cleaning, trying to make enough money to go back and get my family. I found out about the Philadelphia Vigilance Committee. Now, eventually, all the runaways ended up there for one reason or another. Food, money, helped to get started on a new life. I made 
trips back and forth to that office, listening to the stories Mr. William Steele would tell. He was the secretary of the Vigilance Committee. Oh, Harriet. Harriet, Harriet. So many of our people could be helped through the Underground Railroad, but they just don't know about it. They don't know where to go. Come here, look here. Here's a man who wants to make arrangements for his wife and children, but I just don't know who I could send to lead him up here. I'll go. You just tell me when it, and, and, I'll, and I'll bring those people north. No, no, Harriet, no. It's much too dangerous. You're a fugitive yourself. Your picture's posted all over Maryland. They catch you, <laughs> they'll hang you. No, no, it's much, much too dangerous. Mr. Still, I've lived with danger all my life. Freedom don't come cheap. All right, Mr. Still. <laughs> When do I leave? You see, everybody in this country has the right to be free. Don't let anybody tell you different. And when you get a hold of that freedom, cherish it. Don't take it for granted. My husband's one of those people that takes freedom for granted. John Tubman is a free Negro man. He's, he's tall and he's, he's strong. And, He's good looking too. <laughs> you know, I was, I was so proud of that man being free and getting paid wages for his work. And I was so ashamed of being a slave. I asked Sean, I said, now, how you come to be free? He told me his, his parents were free through manumission. You all know that's when it's stated in the master's will. After the master dies, his slaves be set free. See, you be born to free parents, you be free. You be born a slave parent, you be a slave. I was so scared I'd be sold away, separated from him. I, I tried to talk to John about running away. John, 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 listen to me. Listen to me. I don't want to be a slave all my life. I wish the two of us could just, I know, just run away up north. Yes, that way we can both be free. Hush up, woman. You hush up right now. Somebody could hear you. <laughs> now, uh, uh, we ain't running away nowhere. Now, I ain't running away, and you sure ain't running away nowhere. We gonna stay right where we are. <laughs> and you best believe what I say, woman. Cause if I hear any more of this talk or you really tries and run away, <laughs> I'll go straight to your master and I'll tell on you. So, I sang my goodbyes to the quarter and I slipped into the night. When that old chariot comes, I'm going to leave you. I'm bound for the promised land, friend. I'm going to leave you. Oh, I'm sorry, friend, to leave you. Very well, very well. I'll meet you in the morning. Fare thee well, oh fare thee well. Oh, I'll meet you in the morning when we reach the promised land on the other side of Jordan. For I'm bound for the promised land. So I hope none of y'all take for granted this freedom that we're risking so much to get. And this is going to be a hard trip, too, and an even longer one, because I got to take y'all 
all the way to Canada. Oh, yes, you see, they've, they strengthened that Fugitive Slave Act. You no longer safe in New York or Pennsylvania. And them, them patter rollers, they're making it real tough on me. My picture's posted everywhere. They catch you up north, they'll ship you right back to your master. No questions asked, no. I can't trust Uncle Sam with my people no longer. I'm going to take y'all all the way to Canada. And that Fugitive Slave Act's going to be nipping at my behind all the way. That's all right. The Lord will see us through. He did it for Joe Bailey. He'll do it for you. You don't know Joe Bailey. Just like you, he was a passenger of mine. Very strong, dark-skinned man. Highly valued by his master. His master used to hire him out the way mine hired me out. Well, the man that hired him liked his work so well, he wanted to buy him. He paid $2,000 for Joe. Well, this new master came riding into the slave quarters, stopped before the cabin he'd given Joe, and he called out, Joe! Joe! Come on, boy. Get on out here. <laughs> That's it. Now you go on over there and you strip so you can take your licking. <laughs> now, Joe, I don't have any complaints. Your work's real good. But boy, you belong to me now. And I always starts out by giving my niggas a good whipping. Now you strip and you take it. <laughs> <laughs> That's all for now, Joe. Well, Joe took his whipping without a word. As as he pulled his shirt up over his torn and bleeding back, he swore that that would never happen again. On my next trip to Maryland, word got back to me that a slave named Joe Bailey was looking to join Moses on her next trip to the Promised Land. Here's the rest of our passengers, so we might as well get going. Everybody gather up your things. We're going to move fast, and we're going to move quiet. So keep your eyes on that North Star. Keep your mind on the task. And let your hearts be full of joy. Let me hear you sing. When Israel was in the Egypt's land, let my people go. Oppressed so hard they could not stand. Let my people go, go down, Moses, way down to Egypt's land, tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Let my people go. 
How magnificent was that performance? Let's all give Gwendolyn Briley Strand a round of applause. Um, Gwendolyn has joined us to answer a few questions about her performance as Harriet Tubman in The Chosen One. Hello, everyone. Um, as people are typing their questions in the chat, um, I know I have just one question for you. Um, that's amazing. Um, how did you prepare? Oh my, well, you know, um, I went through weeks and weeks of rehearsal and I've been doing this show now um, 30 years. And so with, um, getting into each character, but especially the heart and soul of Miss Tubman and just just sitting with her and um, and absorbing absorbing her, her feelings, her world. Um, it was it was a, a wonderful experience for me. Thank you. Thank you. We do have uh, one one question. Uh, from Eli Routes. Uh, okay. Why did Harriet Tubman risk everything to save people? Uh, thank you, Eli, for the question. You know, she felt that, and that's why I gave it the title, The Chosen One. She felt she was chosen by God. She felt this was her purpose in life, um, to, to rescue her people, freedom, was so important as it is now, so important. And this was her purpose. And when you know your purpose, then you're destined and you know that God is on your side and no weapon formed against you shall prosper. She just kept on going. She knew she was so positive that she would not get caught because she knew that this was given to her, her assignment in life from the Almighty. Thank you. Uh, we have two more questions that are in the chat. Um, do you think Harriet Tubman was scared? <laughs> well, you know, I think she did have, um, she had a, a different type of fear. Of course, she got scared at times, but it wasn't a paralyzing fear or anything. And she knew, she knew that through her faith that God would record, would would just bring her through each and every time. So um, it was, and she believed, you see, Harriet Tubman almost knew the Bible by heart. She never learned how to read or write. She was illiterate, but she, she people read it to her and she hid the word of God in her heart. And she hid that part that God said, I did not give you a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. And she walked her life through with that scripture in mind. Thank you. Um... So as uh, the other questions come in, we have a question. As a, as a woman, as a woman, why was she the leader? Oh, why was she? Well, you know, and that's that's a good question because so many times we think of leaders as men and Harriet Tubman got away with a lot of things in the very beginning because they thought this Moses was a man. 
I mean, all of the miraculous things that she did, it couldn't have been a woman, had to be a man. And then eventually it came out that it was Araminta Ross, Harriet Tubman, who was this Moses. So um, that was that. That's an insightful question. So many people think that it's only men, but oh no, we have a history of great, great women that have done so much for this country. Yes, yes. Um, we are, I see someone typing. Um, so I'm gonna move on to the next uh, question. Why, let's see. They're typing. <laughs> How many times did she, how many times did she travel throughout Maryland to bring people through the Underground Railroad? Well, she made she made 11 trips on the Underground Railroad over a period of 10 years. And which is remarkable. Um, when we when we first got the stories, the children's stories of Harriet Tubman, they said that she brought hundreds of thousands of people uh, from the south to the north, um, which isn't quite so. She brought around 70 and she traveled about 10 years, 11 trips. And um, at first I thought, when, uh, because I'm constantly reading more and more and more, the, to do these shows, your, your, your study of the characters really never stops. You create a play. But in order to answer the questions, you have to keep studying, reading as much as many books and and absorbing as much about her life, the people around her and the times. And so I said, well, you know, that I thought she rescued more people. I thought she took more time. But you know what? The fact that she went back one time, I don't know if I would have gone back after enduring slavery for almost 30 years, would I have gone back into the jaws of slavery to bring someone else? I, I don't know. I hope I would. I hope I would, but I don't know. I'd be real know. brave to do that. Really, I don't know if I'm as much woman as Miss Tubman <laughs> was. And I'm so grateful so grateful that she had such a strong spirit and she listened to the will of God and she and she was obedient. Yeah, she was obedient. We have a question that came in uh, from Miss Portia Hartwell. Um, she, she says, I want to always learn more, but I get so emotional. How do you work <laughs> through that so I can be more educated? Ah, you know, um, we can't help from uh, getting emotional. We have a history of abuse and degradation that is thick through these 400 years that Black people in this country have been fighting just to exist in America with the equality of whites. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we just have to persevere. We just have to keep going. And it's okay to get emotional. Now, you can't get too emotional as an actor on stage and lose it, but it's good to, the, to experience the emotion. I still, I still cry sometimes over our history, especially what's going on in 2020, 2021, what's going on now in our present time. But we have to persevere. We cannot let that great cloud of witnesses that is looking down our ancestors, that is, they are uh, depending on us to finish the work that they started. So uh, we just straighten our backbone. <laughs> we read some more, we cry some more, and we keep going. Keep going. Thank you, Portia. Thank you, Portia. Uh, Councilwoman Lundy uh, asked a question. 
What other women have you appeared as over the years? And do you have a favorite and why? Ah, um, I have done um, Miss Parks, which I love doing, Rosa Parks. I have done Sojourner Truth. I have done uh, Wilma Rudolph. Uh, she was just an amazing, amazing athlete and woman. And the um, I have done, uh, I have done a narration of um, Marian Anderson. I have done um, our. Let me see. I think that's the. Those are the women that I have done over the years. It's hard to say because I love each one the same, you know, for different reasons. Uh, Rosa Parks for that, that, that quiet strength that she had and that stalwart spirit. I love the buck wildness of Harriet Tubman and how she just rolled up her sleeves and she said, I'm just going to do what I need to do. Uh, Wilma Rudolph was an amazing woman that had so many uh, physical disabilities that God brought her through. And um, that would be, that's a character that I probably would have done more for longer, but she died so young that the older I got, I sort of outgrew her, 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 her lifespan. Um, Marian Anderson, I love telling her story. I loved it. Now, Marion did the singing and I did the talking, but I oh. love telling, I love telling her story. And there's so many other women that I would like to still do. Barbara and uh, Barbara Jordan is someone that I would love to do, but we'll see. We'll see. Um, you uh, never know how much time I have left. <laughs> uh, one more question. Okay. Um, and this is from Zachary Joppy. And he said, how do you prepare for your wonderful roles as Harriet Tubman, Rosa Parks, and other women that you have portrayed? Please share how, how, how you prepare. Okay. Well, first I read up on, and I study the, um, the people that the women that I do, and there is, um, there is a method to me choosing the characters that I do. I love strong Christian women because I think it's important um, to, for you to see the, the physicality, but also the, the, the spirituality of these women. And um, I read as much as I can. I travel around and to the places that these women um, habited, inhabited and all of that. And then I sit down quietly and just meditate and absorb the spirit of each of the women that I'm doing. And I just pray that I, I give them uh, their due justice because they, um, I want you to feel the greatness of each character that I do. Thank you for that question. Well, Gwen, we 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 definitely have felt uh, Harriet Tubman's spirit today with that magnificent performance. I just want to thank you so much uh, for taking the time to be with us here today as we remember our past and honor our presence. Thank you. God bless you all. Thank you. God bless you. Next on our schedule for today, we will honor our present by recognizing the rich history that the town of Bladensburg has. I would like to introduce to you our first African-American female mayor of the town of Bladensburg. You already met her today, Mayor Takesha James, who will present to you um, an honor of our first African-American male mayor, Mr. David C. Harrington. Good afternoon, I'm Mayor James and 
I'm so honored to be here with Mr. David C. Harrington at the David C. Harrington Community Park. As many of you know, Mr. Harrington was our first African-American mayor in the town of Bladensburg. And given that it's Black History Month, we thought it fitting to honor our first African-American uh, mayor in the town of Bladensburg. For those who may not know uh, about Mr. Harrington, I'll share a few things. Uh, but again, most of you, I'm assuming, know quite a bit. Uh, first of all, he served in, from 1995 to 2002 as our mayor. And during that time, our community saw many, many improvements. Uh, one of which that comes to mind is his advocating for the raising of the bridge across Annapolis Road. Uh, many of you know the traffic backups used to drive many Prince Georgians crazy as they tried to commute, or I should say as we tried to commute from the county into the district. But Mr. Harrington fought tirelessly to get the train tracks elevated. And I believe it was once you became county council member that they were finally, that project finally came to fruition and was named after Senator Gwendolyn T. Britt, who was another local uh, piece of our history. But Mr. Harrington took his service to a whole new level by being elected to the Prince George's County Council in 2002. And as a council member, I can tell you between him and his constituent services, they did so much, not just for Bladensburg, but for our entire district. In 2008, Mr. Harrington was appointed to serve in the Maryland State Senate, where he served and again, brought back so many uh, resources to the district, and we're grateful for that. Mr. Harrington has not given up on community service, even though he's not in office, he just doesn't know how to rest. Now, he's president and CEO of the Prince George's County Chamber of Commerce, where he's helping many of our small business owners grow and have fruition and really expand particularly given the pandemic that we're in, providing many resources to them. And so again, we wanted to take this time to honor Mr. Harrington. Um, there's a saying in our community, give me my flowers and accolades while I'm here and can appreciate them. And so that's very much what this moment is about today. I also have to take a moment to thank his wife, Cheryl, who's been by his side for many, many years. His son, Stephen and Christopher, who know what it's like to have a dad who's in office serving the community and sharing dad with people from Bladensburg all the way up throughout the state. And I um, just wanna say thank you to them for supporting Mr. Harrington while he's taking care of many residents such as myself. And finally, I just wanna say thank you, Mr. Harrington for living out the motto of Howard University, which is Veritas et Utilitas, Truth and Service. Uh, may God bless you. I'll let you say a few words and then I'll present the award. Well, Mia, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, it was this park that actually uh, made me run for mayor because uh, it was all dilapidated and I had two baby sons and I worked sometimes late at night and I said, look, I got to get to the town to do some changes here and you know, get rebuffed, rebuffed. And I said, you know what, I'm just gonna run for mayor. And I won by a whopping margin of two votes. I was three, uh, 385 uh, for the person who ran against me, and I got 387. And at that time, that was the most votes ever received in the, in the mayoral race. Um, so my family lived here, you're right. Uh, Cheryl and I have been married for over 37 years. We started our family right down the street there. And I'll never forget this place. This is, Bladensburg is will always, wherever I live, Bladensburg will always be home uh, for me. So I love this town. I really am humbled by this acknowledgement. And this, this, this honor here, um, while you're still living, is like you said, uh, is, is something that I will always cherish. Um, like you, I'm a graduate from Howard University. That's where I got the seeds of, of being involved in the community, was from Howard University. So thank you so much, Mayor. I really appreciate it. And, and I accept this award with humility. And so the award reads, the town of Bladensburg, uh-oh, and the, uh, right there. The town of Bladensburg celebrates David C. Harrington in honor of Black History Month. We celebrate Bladensburg's first African-American mayor, we thank you for your outstanding leadership and service, 1995 to 2002 as our mayor. 
Oh, God bless this is you. beautiful. Uh, God bless you too, and God bless the town of Bladensburg, and may it always thrive. And you can call on me anytime awesome. for Thank your plans you. to build this town. So appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Beautiful. Yes, thank you so much, Mayor Keisha James, uh, who is our present mayor and uh, the history that you have made. And thank you, uh, David C. Harrington, for paving the way um, for young uh, people like myself who just truly want to make a difference in our communities. Continuing with acknowledging our future, our very own Officer Tanksley and resident Mrs. Vivian Ibiski will be performing a rap. Vivian Ibiski is the CEO of the youth-led grassroots organization, Stand Up. Stand Up fights against gun violence and police brutality in the DMV area, while encouraging young people to become more civic-minded in their everyday lives. Miss Vivian is joined by Officer Tanksley, badge ID number 338. Officer Tanksley has been working with the Bladensburg Police Department going on five years. Well, it'll be five years in May of 2021. Officer Tanksley serves out of the Community Action Team Unit for the Bladensburg Police Department. As an officer of the Community Action Team, he tries his best to serve diligently he finds it an honor to inspire, influence, and impact the lives by serving. Without further ado, Officer Tanksley and Miss Vivian. Oh, that was, I mean, we have so many talented individuals that live in our town of Bladensburg. And I just want to applaud Officer Tanksley and Miss Vivian just to, for their phenomenal rap. I'm going to call some of my friends, you know, and a and say, hey, we got some good talent, you know. Uh, just kidding. But, um, you know, I, I just want to uh, take this time to um, thank all of our performers uh, because as Mayor James started us off, um, you know, we are in 
a, a difficult situation right now. We are facing um, a pandemic uh, that we can't see. We are experiencing um, in our face racial inequities and uh, discord um, in the United States of America. But it's things like this, that we celebrate our past, honor our present, and just give kudos to one another for being bright, being awesome, being blessed, being smart, being brilliant. Um, and to each of you watching at home, uh, we truly thank you for coming um, and spending some time with us to celebrate our, hitch, our history. Our history is rich, it is amazing. Um, and um, just for my own uh, special thanks to Gwendolyn Briley Strand, who's my soror, um, thank you for keeping uh, the stories of these women alive uh, because it is through art that you are able to share uh, your contributions to remind our young people um, that we have some rich, rich history and we should celebrate that. Well, uh, unfortunately, we are at the end of our program and I just want to say uh, continue to wear your mask, consider taking the vaccine if, uh, if, if it's your time, uh, make sure to wash your hands for at least 20 seconds. Um, and I look forward to seeing you at the Bladensburg Council meetings and all of our events. I can't wait till everyone we open back up so we can give each other a big old hug and say, oh, I missed you. Uh, we truly are a great community um, and it is only because of you all who are engaged and you support us um, as uh, in the town council. Um, and I just want to just um, thank you all so much for coming today and uh, remember um, in your lives to honor your past and honor your presence. All right, good evening, everyone.